All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good day. If you're watching the replay, thank you for watching. If you're here with us live, thank you for joining us. My name is Matthew Hegum, as some of you, many of you, I think, know at this point, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Accounting Alchemy Network. We are here to empower accountants to transform the world, as you all know, and we do that in a lot of different ways. One of the ways that we do that is, is, again, you well know at this point, is through our Lyceum series where we bring together really amazing minds to talk about some of the things that are super important to us as what we define as a regenerative accounting professional. And so for those of you who are maybe new to the community, just a, a, a sort of a recap of some things, right? You know that you get your email from us once a month that talks about all of the upcoming events we've got going on. We are moving into December, so we're getting a little bit quieter before we enter into the new year. But we also have our YouTube channel where we have all of the replays of all of the amazing content that we've talked about ranging from things like humane workplace and environmental justice through to things that you can do to make a difference around diversity, equity, and inclusion in your workplaces. And so we're really excited today to have a conversation on regenerative economics. I'm going to pass the ball over to Ingrid, who's going to introduce our guests and get us started on today's Lyceum. Over to you, Ingrid. Thank you, Matthew. Yes, I am super, super excited to welcome Della Duncan, and recognizing that today is not a Lyceum conversation. This is an actual webinar with slides and all kinds of great things. We're gonna dive into some really great conversations um, that really started, I wanna thank Alina for kind of <laughs> creating the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, yay, and Alina posting in the chat, hooray. And welcome to each of you who is, who is here um, on Zoom with us today. We've got some fun things coming up and um, just having had the opportunity to meet with Della and just start kicking off a little bit of relationship. Della, I'm so excited about the work that you are doing in regenerative economics and in your work with the Upstream podcast and as a, a right livelihood coach and learning more about what that means as we're delving into that and just recognizing where so many of the financial professions, particularly accounting and economics, are kind of siloed. We're delving into some very, very similar realms. And at the same time, economics is like Greek to many accountants and accounting is like Greek to many economists. And having talked a little bit with our mutual friend, Emma Woods, at one point, she said 95% of economics is common sense. And it's like, oh, yeah, well, 95% of accounting is common sense. So let's start cross-pollinating some of these ideas. And we're so excited to have you here today with us to talk about not just economics, but specifically regenerative economics and what that means and how accounting professionals can leverage our roles as financial professionals to start creating the changes that we want to see in the world. So thank you so much for joining us. And with that, I will toss it to you, Della. Thank you so much and deep gratitude to Ingrid, Matthew, Alina, and all of you in this network. This is so good to be with you all. We thought we'd begin with a presencing moment just to help us arrive and settle into this time together. Whether you're listening on, on Facebook or to the recording or live, whatever day, time of the day it is, just a moment to settle into this time together to reflect on regenerative economics and our location in economic systems change. So I just want to invite you wherever you are to just take a moment if it feels comfortable, you can close your eyes. If it feels comfortable to place your attention on your breathing. And I'm just gonna ring the bell twice, once to just punctuate a chance to presence, to arrive, a few moments of silence, and then I'll ring the bell again and we'll dive in.
All right. Good to be with you all. I'm going to start with a quote. This quote is from Yanis Varoufakis, the former finance minister of Greece. We must all understand that empowering citizens to speak authoritatively about the economy is a prerequisite for democracy and a precondition for the good society. There are no economic experts. There are experts when it comes to things like building a bridge. If you want to build a bridge, you can't do it democratically because the bridge could collapse and it would be a major crime. But the economy is the way in which we organize social power. Who does what to whom? Who has power over their lives and who doesn't? And that is a question of how we run our society. It's a question about democracy. So if we were to accept that there's a group of experts and we must defer to them when it comes to economic matters, then effectively we accept oligarchy. So again, that's Yanis Varoufakis. And sharing that as a way of introducing part of regenerative economics is democratizing economic systems making and systems thinking. So that's one invitation for what we'll be doing today. So I'll be sharing a little bit, making it as engaging as I can. And then we're going to go into the assumptions underlying mainstream economic thinking, and then the invitations for regenerative economics, a little bit of integration, and then some time for open discussion questions and themes. Um, and I will be sharing the quotes and the notes with our lovely hosts so they can disseminate this to those on the in the network. So I want to start with a little engaging activity. I love Ingrid that you brought in, you know, what some folks, especially in accounting, think of economics and vice versa. So I want to do a little word association activity or play. So if for those of us watching live here live, if you can just type in the chat a little word association, just a little waterfall of words, whatever comes to mind, no wrong answers here. Uh, just to get a sense of our associations and connections. So if you can open your chat and just be able to type. So the first one, we're open, we're tennis ready, as they say, open for the first word. Let's do a practice round. The first word is ice cream, ice cream. This is our test. So just type in any words associated with ice cream, yummy, summer, cold, jelly tip. Okay. Mint chocolate chip, sweet, strawberry, vanilla, chocolate, sugar, freeze, messy. All right, right on. Let's shake that one out. Perfect. You get the idea. You get this. So that's word association. Let's do another one. Pleasure. Beautiful. Let's try another one. So we're tennis ready. Our fingers are ready on the keyboard or on our phones. We're ready. Okay, next word. Money. Money. Word association. Whatever comes. No wrong answers. Money. Money. All right, we have stress. Flow, choices, none, options, fairness, greed, hoarding, anxiety, growth, power, freedom, empowerment, opportunity, tool for exchange. Beautiful. Okay, so lots of different, different opportunity and anxiety, freedom and greed and hoarding and empowerment, right? There's a lot of things going on there. So let's take that one out. Shake that one out. Go to the next one. Next one, getting our fingers ready. Next word, work. 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 Energy, effort, passion, stress, play, contribution, pay, compensation, fun, enslavement, impact, a boss, humane workplaces, collaboration. Wow. Again, a lot of differentiation, right? Different feelings and reactions, colleagues, culture. Beautiful. Let's shake it out. Let's just do one more word association. You're doing wonderfully. Getting our fingers ready. Last one. Economics. Economics. No wrong answers. Whatever comes is right on. All right. Math, confusion, science, regenerative study, smart people, supply and demand, 
rational man, us, magic, long books. I love it. Beautiful. All right, let's shake that out. Ah, oh, yeah, good. It's just good to get that out. Politics. Yep. So economics, very interesting and absolutely can have this feeling of math and science and study and supply and demand and rational man and long books and confusion and math. So today, just like democratizing economic thinking, I think there'll be an invitation to expand our perception of what is economics, to demystify it, hopefully. So I want to start with the assumptions underlying mainstream economic thinking. I'm going to start with a, a study or a article about a group of studies. And again, I'll share this after. So the article is called, Does Studying Economics Breed Greed? Does Studying Economics Breed Greed? And it was written by someone named Dr. Adam Grant. And in the article, he brings together all of these studies on this topic, Does Studying Economics Breed Greed? And here's what he found. Here's the studies that he came up with or that he discovered. Did you know that in the United States, economics professors give the least amount of money to charity than professors of any other field? Economics professors are the least charitable professors than any other discipline. He also found that altruism drops among students who study economics in university setting. So the first year students of all disciplines ranked values like helpfulness, honesty, loyalty, responsibility, equal to their counterparts of all majors, pretty equal. But as they started to study economics, after just two years, these values dropped in importance to them. So altruism dropped in importance as a value to students who study economics. He also found that altruistic values drop in economics majors through a study of an envelope of lost money. So I want you to imagine you're entering a building and you see an envelope on the ground and you pick up the envelope and it has cash in it. Like it literally has money in it. And you're like, what is this? The question in the study is, what do you do with the envelope? Economic students were the most likely to be deceitful and keep the envelope of money. They were the least likely to turn it in or say, hey, did someone drop this? And, and this one's very important, they were the most likely to think everyone else would be the same. One more study in this article. Even thinking about economics and being exposed to mainstream economic rhetoric makes us less compassionate and empathetic. So what he found was that in one experiment, uh, groups of business leaders and organizational leaders were exposed to articles and text conveying mainstream economic thinking and rhetoric. And then they had to write a letter conveying bad news to an employee, like they were being transferred or they were being fired or something like that. And then they had a group of other folks who were exposed to neutral words. And then they had them write a letter conveying bad news to an employee. Both sets of letters were then coded for empathy and compassion. And what they found is that those people who were exposed to mainstream economic rhetoric were far less kind, compassionate, and empathetic in their delivery. So if you're worried, it's okay. This is going to be a different type of economics. But my question for you all, and this is something that's already coming in through the chat, is why? Why is this? What are the assumptions underlying mainstream economic thinking? That's what I want to ask you all. What are the assumptions that would lead to this type of result? What are some of them? You can type them in the chat. What are the assumptions underlying mainstream economic thinking. All right, I have someone who wrote the invisible hand, right? The invisible hand of the market, the market determines value, absolutely. And what part of what that tells me is that economics has gone through a process of what can be described as physics envy. 
So it has become increasingly mathematizable and quantifiable. It has had physics envy. And as a result, there are certain assumptions around who we are as humans, and there are certain equations that can be discovered, such as the invisible hand or the market determines value. Earlier, somebody actually wrote one of the assumptions, which is rational man, rational man. So there's an assumption that's helpful for the, helpful for the equations in mainstream economics that's described as we as humans are homo economicus, homo economicus, that we are rational, self-interested beings, right? That want to work as little as possible. So we see work as a disutility and yeah, we prioritize our own self-interest. And then that's what's actually most helpful for the economy. So that is one assumption around economics. And I do see someone point out that even physics has moved on as well as math. There's beauty and art in math and science and economics has become increasingly math and mathematizable and quantifiable. And again, not to say there's not val validity in the mathematizable and quantifiable in economics, but it's become reduced to that. What else? I see somebody named everyone is out for themselves, right? This kind of view of humans as competitive or self-interested again, yes. I also see somebody say that an assumption around mainstream economic thinking is that it's based in capitalism. As Margaret Thatcher said, Tina, there is no alternative to neoliberal capitalism. So this idea that mainstream economics is really to capitalism, there is no viable alternative. Um, and it's also even not very, um, it's ahistorical, so it doesn't really perceive the past and it doesn't really think of the future. Mainstream economics is very short term in its thinking. That's another assumption. What else? What about an assumption around nature? What's the assumption in mainstream economic thinking around the natural world? Somebody has shared that the profession of economics has been historically limited to people who are interested in maintaining the unsustainable status quo. Absolutely. Yeah. No rest. Yeah. Um, this, this idea that work is a disutility and productivity is, is how we have our assign our value. Absolutely. Somebody is sharing that nature is for us to use, that the natural world is dead or inert and that it's made up of resources to be exploited. Absolutely, that it's a resource to be consumed. I also see someone bring up growth, right? In mainstream economic thinking, there's an assumption that growth is good, right? Growth is what we're measuring. Well, growth is our sign of progress in terms of profit for a business, in terms of income or wealth for an individual, and in terms of GDP or gross domestic product for a community, a city, or a state, or a country. So yeah, growth. And not only is it good and a worthy end goal in itself, but that it is um, unlimited, that it's possible to keep growing. That's another assumption. Yeah. That humans and natural resources are for us to exploit and capitalize on. Yes. And that humans are separate from nature and have power over it. Absolutely. So these are all assumptions underlying mainstream economic thinking. A few others, one of them is around um, meritocracy. So the idea that if we work hard, that we can achieve wealth or, or gain. Um, and this idea that if somebody is maybe houseless or struggling financially, it again, assigns it to their value in society or their productivity or their work ethic. And it doesn't understand intersectionality right? Legacies of, of oppression or histories of primitive accumulation or ongoing accumulation. So exploitation of people and place. So yeah, absolutely. That's another assumption around mainstream economic thinking. And that we can put a dollar sign on the value of an ecosystem, a tree, right? Or a river, for example. So these are some yeah, meritocracy does not account for institutionalized racism and class systems. Absolutely. Yeah, somebody brought up the term human capital, right? Absolutely. We understand the world enough to make inventions and predictable certain outcomes. Yeah, exactly. That's that mathematizability, that quantifiability. People who studied economics could afford to go to those schools. Yeah. 
And economics too, mainstream economics can feel quite siloed. So if somebody is in economic anthropology or in sociology or even in political economy, they're seen as like less validity to them as an economist. So it's very, um, very tight knit in what is considered economics. So let's shake that out. Let's shake that out because that we all knew those things. We're we're indoctrinated with them. Perhaps we've even studied them. We've been in those classrooms. And I know that we can all see the ways that they lead to the challenges that we face today. The challenges of feeling divided from one another, the challenges of feeling divided from the more than human world, the challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss, of houselessness, et cetera. So just to name that these assumptions are really what is fueling the ecological, social, and political challenges of our time. So this is a time for regenerative economics. And fortunately, there's beautiful movements in the past and the present, the future, in many places in the world that are really working to reclaim economics and reclaim economic thinking and invite alternatives. So I'm going to share some alternatives um, right now with you. So I'm going to share a screen in order to do this so that we can we can see some some images. I find that helpful. So these are now some um, offerings for invitations for regenerative economics. All right. So my first invitation for us for re uh, regenerative economics is to rethink economics. And I just love that Ingrid brought up that for some folks in accounting, economics is Greek to them. And I love that that's a phrase because I was going to ask, does anyone know the etymology of the word economics? So the etymology is actually Greek. That's why I thought that was funny. So the etymology of economics comes from eco, oikos, home. Okay, so eco, oikos, home. And nomics, which is management or caretaking of or stewarding of. So originally economics was the domestic home. It was the management of the domestic home. And then it, it, it expanded out to be the management of the nation state home. And what many folks and regenerative economics practitioners are saying today is due to the nature of the interconnectedness of our planetary systems, of our ecological systems, 21st century economics must be about planetary home management. Planetary home management. So a question for all of us is, who is responsible for planetary home management, right? Certainly it is not just a, a small few who call themselves economists, but really all of us play a part in managing collectively our home, including the rivers and the winds and the pollinators and the fungi, right? All of us are part of economic management or home management of the 21st century. So one way to rethink economics is to return economics to its root, to planetary home management to, and to expand economics to something that we all participate in and co-create. Another way, another invitation to rethink economics is to return economics to when it became part of institutions and departments. Adam Smith, he was a moral philosopher and economics was in the department of moral philosophy. So again, economics since then has become increasingly mathematized and quantified. And again, not to say that's not beautiful or there's not use in that. But what if we were to re-expand economics to bring in the questions of morality? What are the things that ought to be privatized? Should water be privatized? Should healthcare be privatized? What are, what are universal, right? What should we have access to? How much work is too much work? Or, you know, what, what is, is uh, parenting work, right? Like these are moral and ethical questions. And to return economics to the realm of moral philosophy is to broaden what we can ask and what we can challenge and to have ethical and moral conversations around our economic systems making. And then the final invitation of rethinking economics is to 
break out of that way that economics can be seen as Tina. There is no alternative um, to capitalism. And I want to invite something Gibson Graham, two feminist economists, what they write about, they say, actually, there's a global sea of capitalism with many islands of alternatives. And there's actually many different economic systems that we all embody and co-create every day. So if anyone today is a parent, then you were part of the caring economy. If anyone caretakes a, um, an older person or a person with special needs, that's the caring economy. If you gave anything to your neighbor or a ride to a friend, that's the gift economy. There's the solidarity economy, the new economy, the next system, right? Buddhist economics. There's all these different economic systems with all these different regenerative principles and practices. And so when we recognize all these different economic systems and the ways that we participate in them, we rise them out of the global sea of capitalism and we connect them into a movement for regenerative economics. And we take away the power that capitalism has over us. So the first invitation of a regenerative economics is to rethink economics. The second, the second invitation for us all is to redefine the goal. So as I was reflecting on accounting and economics, this quote to me from this quote came to me from a a uh, mentor of mine, Dr. Havan To, and he says, we are attentive to what we measure. We are attentive to what we measure. So one of the highest leverage points in economics, and that language is coming from Danella Meadows and her amazing essay called Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in a System. She ranks acupuncture points of economic systems change. And she says, one of the highest leverage points of changing an economic system or a system is to redefine the goal. And I have great news that there's actually tons of movements all over the world that are redefining the goal. And what is the goal in mainstream economic thinking? It is blind growth. So it is growth of wealth or income for an individual. It's growth of profit for a business. And it's growth of GDP for a country or a city. So to redefine the goal is to say, what is actually important to us? What is it that we actually want to measure? So these are some of the movements. I'm just show, sharing um, a few of the movements that are really inspiring, happening all over the world, that are changing the goal, that are redefining the goal from growth to something more holistic, to something more in alignment with happiness or health or well-being for people on the planet. So here in one corner, we have donut economics from Kate Rayworth, where we have inside the donut meeting the human needs and outside the donut being in alignment or being in consideration of the needs of the planet or of our ecosystems. And the redefining the goal is the goal of an economy ought to be getting within the safe and just space for humanity. Where our needs are met, but we're staying within consideration of the needs of our ecosystems. What if that were the goal of our economic systems? Imagine where you live if that were the goal, to meet the human needs, but stay within the needs of the ecosystem of the natural world that you're a part of. There's the economy for the common good movement coming out of Austria. There's the Wales Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. There's Buen Vivir, coming from Latin and South America, translating roughly to good life, but really bringing in Marxist, feminist, and indigenous thinking and wisdom. And then there's Bhutan, gross national happiness, which is changing the goal from GDP to GNH, gross national happiness, which is a holistic sense of happiness. The former prime minister, Jingmei Tinley, he said, true abiding happiness cannot exist while others suffer and comes only from realizing our true and brilliant nature, serving others and living in harmony with ecology. That is the happiness that they strive for in their economic plan. And they measure it holistically in what are called the nine domains. So they consider things like, if you were unwell, how many people could you call on for support? 
if you had a life celebration, how many people could you call in to come out and celebrate you, right? How much sleep do you get? How much time do you get to spend outdoors? How many names of the local flora and fauna do you know? So they have a holistic sense of what is happiness, and that is what they're seeking. They're also seeking kind of enoughness. There's like sufficiency levels in each of the areas, which is interesting. So it's not growth in every domain forever. So there's a contentedness, a sufficiency or a gratitude that's baked into their model as well. So this is redefining the goal. So the second invitation for regenerative economics is to change the goal, change the goal from blind growth to well-being or happiness for people and the planet. So then what about growth? What happens to growth? And there's many different perspectives and thinkers on this. There's the degrowth movement and the steady state movement. And one that I'll uplift is from Donut Economics, Kate Rayworth. She says, let us be growth agnostic, growth agnostic. So if we change the goal to happiness or well-being for people on the planet, there may be times and places where there is growth in the traditional sense needed, and there may be degrowth that happens. But growth is no longer the end goal, but instead a means to an end. So that's what she means by being growth agnostic. And I'll just uplift for degrowth, really recommend Jason Hickel's work. Less is More is a beautiful book on degrowth that's really powerful about ways that degrowth is not somehow harmful or um, difficult on our lives. It actually is a win-win where we are having a, a four-day work week or banning planned obsolescence or being able to have modular phones and computers that we can switch out parts instead of getting rid of it and get it, buying a whole new one. So there's all sorts of beautiful ways that we can bring degrowth into an economy to redirect growth. So the third invitation is redirect growth. And here I will also add in the business sense, one model is um, the not-for-profit business model. So there's mainstream or traditional nonprofits that receive 60% or more of their income from donations and grant funding. And then there's not-for-profit businesses that receive 60% or more from sale or goods and services. So what I'm saying is there's a model, and it's not as well known, but it's very exciting, where profit or income is redirected to social and environmental good. I'll give an example. In San Francisco, we have The Interval, a very cool swanky bar in San Francisco, you know, those cool big uh, ice cubes and all that. But they pay their workers well, ethical, local, sustainable supply chains, but there is no profit distributed to private owners or shareholders. Instead, 100% of the profit goes to their mission-driven work in their conservation foundation that's literally on the floor above the bar. So that's an example of redirecting growth in the business level. And there's a powerful book that we'll share in the afterwards called How on Earth, um, uh, Imagining a World Without Profit by 2050. And the draft is available. Um, Jennifer Hinton and Donnie McClurkin wrote that draft. So redirecting growth is the third invitation for regenerative economics. What this is, this is a beautiful image that shows that Happiness and income are correlated into a certain in certain amount, but then it plateaus. So this is a very hopeful graph because it tells me that there is a point of sufficiency that we do not need our economies or our own incomes to grow forever. That they have found, including Daniel Kahneman, that happiness and income are correlated to a certain amount, and then it plateaus. So this is just a really hopeful thing to hear about. The next invitation is to reclaim work. So just as I said that in mainstream economics, work is a disutility. So work is something that folks want to do as little of as possible. So what are the ways that we can reclaim work? One of them is to value work that is unpaid, but valuable in society. So it's to expand our definition of work. 
So to see our caretaking, so our parenting, our caretaking of land, of people as work and to value that work, okay? And that really comes from feminist economics and the care economy. It also includes art making and activism to say that that is our work too, our work too in the world. So what would it look and feel like to expand our view on what work is? Another way to reclaim work is to democratize our workplaces. So uh, Richard Wolff, an amazing economist at the New School in New York, he says, we think we live in a democracy, but when we walk into a business, we leave democracy at the door. And what he means by that is when we walk into a business as a worker, the power is very hierarchical and folks who are working, unless they're the owner or the shareholder or the CEO, have very little say over their work and their production. So to reclaim work in the business world is to transition businesses to worker cooperatives, where you have one person, one vote, and you have a say in the decision making and the functions of your workplace. And in nonprofits, even nonprofits can be hierarchical and non-transparent and very unequal in terms of pay. And so to do that transition in a nonprofit is to transition a nonprofit into a worker self-directed nonprofit to bring in things like sociocracy and horizontal governance and circles. So these are ways to democratize your workplaces and be able to reclaim work. Unions are another way of reclaiming work. And one that I'm really excited about or really uh, passionate about is the reframing to right livelihood. Now, right livelihood comes from Buddhist economics and right livelihood, in my understanding, is really taking our spiritualities off the cushion into the world. It's how are you embodying your spiritual values and practices? How are you embodying that work that we're in your world? So having a path of right livelihood is committing to that alignment and saying, how can I make my work contribute to less suffering or harm in the world and instead have my work be a vehicle for systems change and spiritual transformation and a way to contribute in the world. So that's the, the path of right livelihood. So those are some of the ways that we can reclaim work as an invitation for regenerative economics. And another thing to offer is to think of your, um, your work as if it were a garden, as if it were many different plants. This is what will offer that expanded view. So if you're listening either to this recording or listening live, you may want to jot these down and you'll also have them. But I just invite you to consider what are all the ways that you contribute? What are all the plants in your livelihood garden? What are all the ways that you contribute? So the paid plants, the unpaid work, the art making, the caretaking, the activism, what are all the ways, all the plants in your livelihood garden? Now, what fruits do they offer? And that could be money. So sometimes we have work that is paid. Sometimes we have work that is unpaid, but it's something that we do that really supports us in feeling a sense of learning or teamwork, right? So what are all the fruits that your plants offer? What is the relationship between them? Sometimes our plants are symbiotic. There's some cross-pollination. There's some support between them. So what are what's the relationship? Perhaps there's one project that you do that helps you get more accounting clients and vice versa. Maybe there's a relationship there, right? And then another is what seasons or stages are your plants in? Which ones are seeds just taking sprout? Which ones are mature trees? They've been with you for a long time. Which ones are bushes? You know, you can get creative with this, but this is just a way to reflect on these themes around work in a different way. And again, we'll share this so you can dive deeper if you want to later on. When reflecting on your work, what might you wanna water? So what needs attention right now in your livelihood garden? What are the elements that you're like, I wanna give that some more love and attention? What might you wanna plant? You know, it's the time of a new year pretty, at pretty soon. So 
what new project or endeavor are you feeling you want to seed or plant? Which plant might need to be pruned? So which plant is overgrown, maybe taking a lot of space in your garden or really overgrown, uh, maybe a lot of time, a lot of energy. And also, what might you be ready to compost? What might you be ready to say goodbye to? And I love this reframe because it says that anything that we end or terminate is not a failure, but it actually goes into our compost pile and nourishes our soil and allows us to produce or contribute in other ways. And very important, so to work, we also have to think about what's the condition of our soil, which is our self-care. So how is your soil? If you were to check in right now, how is the health of your soil? Is it depleted? Is it in, in, in need of nourishment? Is it in need of connection or rest, rejuvenation? How do you care for your soil? What are the ways that you support yourself, that you deepen your resilience, that you take care of yourself? And what might you want to ask for or seek out as you care for your soil, as you care for your garden? And you're in a community here um, in this Alchemy Accountant Network. So what might you ask for or seek out from this community? Maybe there's someone who can offer support or has an answer to a question you've been seeking. Number five, this invitation for regenerative economics is to redesign in harmony with ecology, redesign in harmony with ecology. So this is all the ways that folks are feeling inspired by nature or noticing in nature, ways that nature moves and is designed and then designing in harmony with nature. So this can be ecological design thinking. This can be um, uh, circular economy practices. So designing uh, zero waste so that a, a product kind of goes back into the loop. Waste equals food, as we say in permaculture. So what are the ways you can design in harmony with ecology? This can also be rights of nature. So there's places around the world that are giving rights to waterways or to mountains. We have Patagonia made earth, it's only shareholder, right? So what would it look and feel like to honor nature, not as a dead object for our use and exploitation, but to honor it and to be in relation with it as we would learn from our indigenous folks. So redesigning in harmony with ecology is another invitation for regenerative economics. And the last one, the last one is reconsider who we want to be as humans. So mainstream economics, as we said, would have us believe that we are homo economicus, rational, self-interested beings. And my own personal view is, yes, we have the capacity to be rational and self-interested, greedy beings who maximize our own self-interest, who keep that envelope of money and don't turn it in. We have that capacity in all of us, but we also have the capacity to be kind, to be altruistic, to be caring and compassionate. So who do we want to be? There's a different idea. We could be homo donans, gift-giving beings, really engaging with the gift economy and also the gift paradigm. The gift paradigm is doing something for the gift that it gives someone else. So these are subtle things relating to paradigms and worldviews and shifts. But really, what would it feel like to engage in that worldview? Robin Wild Kimmerer is a, is a writer who wrote an amazing piece called The Service Berry, An Economy of Abundance, an amazing essay, The Service Berry, An Economy of Abundance, in which she learns about the gift economy from a berry, from the service berry, about the gift-giving practices and beauty of the gift-giving um, nature of nature. So perhaps we might we might learn from that way of thinking as well. So reconsider who we want to be as humans. So I'm going to pause there because I know that was so much and it may have felt like a lot. It may have felt like an overwhelm, but I'd love to hear what resonated, what touched us, what made sense to us and how, how to do that is I'd love for us to get into pairs because this way we can share with one another what resonated. So I would just love a little time in pairs, three minutes each 
for us to share what resonated, what stood out. Try to make sense of it in your own life, in your own work, maybe. Um, what questions are emerging? It's one of the best ways of learning is to try to share back what it is that you've heard. So if there's something you want to try to share back, feel free. So in a moment, we'll put you in pairs. Let's have the longer haired person in your pair. You can go first. Feel free to introduce yourself and then share for three minutes. What resonated? What stood out to you? What, what connected with your own lived experience or reality? What do you want to know more about? And then we'll put in the chat in the broadcast time to switch. And then you'll go ahead and switch. And the other person, shorter haired being, three minutes to share. What stood out? What resonated? What lingering questions do you have? And then we will come back and hear from folks and then move into an all group discussion. So we can go ahead and uh, pause the recording and then go ahead and get into breakout rooms. So I'm going to have a totally transparent webinar moment, facilitation moment with you. I am seeing that Zoom did an update and my breakout option is gone. <laughs> this is my Zoom account. And um, I know that I did breakouts recently in another thing. And but for some reason, it's not present on this particular webinar. And I don't know why. All so good. let's do a not, quick... We're a small group. We're a small yeah. group anyway. So take a moment. Yeah, take a moment to just reflect. You can write or you can just think what resonated with you? Because that was a lot of stuff and it's okay that not everything did, but just what stood out to you? What resonated? What touched you or what made sense in your own work and your own life? And what what lingering questions you have? What what do you want to know more about? Or what's what's still what's still lingering for you? So just yeah. take let's take a, a moment to reflect on that and then we can hear from folks. And Matthew and I can give voice to some of what's coming up in the chat also. I'm seeing some beautiful things. I'm so in love. Um, with Do we have a way to hear folks if they'd like to share or is it only chat? We would have to promote them to panelists. So if we want to turn this into more of a meeting style setting. Um, if if, if anyone would like to share that, that way, yeah. um, we're totally open to that. So just put so in the chat. So if you would like, like to be promoted to panelists, go ahead and raise your hand using the reactions button in Zoom and I will go ahead and promote you to panelists. Mariette is saying, sure. Thank you, Mariette. Welcome, Mariette. Hi, welcome. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm not sure, are we sharing or are we still thinking and then sharing? Go ahead and share. Yeah. Um, so, well, just my, my me, I'm here with my kids outside. So this is the casual me. <laughs> um, so I, I'm in love with the explanation of work. Um, I think it was when you were the reframing, I think it was either reframing work or, or um, I, I can't remember what it said on the slide, but anyway, retaking work or something like that. But anyway, you went deep into how we can um, look at it like from a garden because I think that um, when you asked what work was, like the first thing that came to me was passion. Of course, I saw my beautiful Ingrid put play. And I think we both can like resonate that that's what work can mean for us. Um, if we choose to do work or the, the type of work we choose. But I love the idea of it being a garden, because if you think about a garden, at least for me, I don't have a green thumb so much. Um, so I was thinking when you said a garden, it's like if I had a green thumb or in this perfect world, I did like I know I'd still have different choices of my garden. Some of the things would be harder to grow or I'd struggle with and other things. I just feel like this would be perfectly blooming because they just really align with me. So that explanation of like thinking of work or reframing work like a garden and knowing that it's not always going to be perfect and you're not always going to do it right and things are going to die on you probably you know um and so just I just thought that was such a beautiful reframe to the concept of work and then even like bringing it back to economics I think that was my biggest question is like so we fr we reframe work to be a garden but then how do we bring that back to to economics I think that's where I got a bit lost yes thank you and I'm so happy that resonated so how do we bring this back to economics? Well, well, first, one thing to share is um, I love what you said about not all plants bloom or, you know, uh, take root or take seed. And so I do love this idea 
in terms of personal accounting, perhaps, that diversity builds resilience. So in, in ecology, in gardens, in, in permaculture, diversity builds resilience. So one thing I think of when working with clients as a right livelihood coach is if we just have one plant, it's not very resilient. But if we have many different things, then we build resilience. So it, it builds resilience financially, but it also can build resilience in terms of meeting our needs. So part of economics on the individual level is asking ourselves, what is enoughness? For each of us. So um, one thing that can be useful in terms of post-growth thinking or to kind of undo capitalism in our minds is to find our own point of enoughness. So what are your needs? What are the ways that you meet your needs? What are the ways that we meet our needs in financialized ways? Because there are many needs that we must meet in financialized ways, such as, you know, having a cell phone or technology or a home, or if you're in the United States, healthcare, right? So there's all these things that we have to meet in financialized ways. And then another beautiful question is, what are the solidarity, gift economy, new economy ways that we can meet our needs without financialized ways? So what are the um, more solidaristic or mutual aid ways that we can meet our needs? For example, somebody has a child, you can have a child care collective. So in one home, children are taken care of on Monday, the next home Tuesday, they're taken care of. Child care is provided. Um, there's community building and there's also um, rest or time for reflection or whatever for the parents. So that's one solidarity economy way, but like trade and all that can be part of it. So once somebody can do that, they can find what is enoughness. What is that amount that they need? So I think that's one thing. And then you can think about your garden um, as how much do I need my garden to produce in order to sustain myself, but also so that my garden is contributing to the whole. So it's kind of um, the connection is how can we each participate in economics in a way that we're contributing, but also meeting our needs. That's one. Um, but another thing is that I, I do think like people like to think in um, widening spheres or in uh, things that are like balancing of one another. So sometimes we can look at our garden and go, wow, all my things are very local. What would it feel like to have a plant that's working at the global level, right? Or wow, all my plants are very um, like hands-on. What would it feel like to have a plant that's more heady or heart focused? So there's all these different ways that we can work with the garden to think about how to contribute to economic systems change and how to have more balance in our own livelihood paths. And in general, the reframing of work is really unhooking the work from the capitalist perspective, which is work is something we do for money. Um, you know, work that has value is that which is paid the most, right? So it's undoing a lot of those things in our own life. Um, and then the soil part is bringing in that rest. I'm thinking of Trisha Hersey and her book, Rest is Resistance and the nap ministry on Instagram. So bringing in rest and, um, and reflection and the importance of nourishing our soil and our self-care, bringing in that importance too. So that's another piece of the model. So those are a few ways that it connects. Fantastic. Uh, I want to note Marianne had a uh, Marriott had a fantastic follow up question in the chat, and I also see Matthew's hand up. So, um, Marriott, do you want to unmute and speak to that question? Or would you like me to read it off? Yeah, I can speak to it. So, I mean, again, I'm like right now when you were speaking, I would literally have my eyes closed and I was visualizing what you were saying. Like I wanted to even paint it. Like I, I want to go back and listen to this replay and have my daughter draw it because she's an artist. Um, because I can I can see it now with the example. But what now I just just to be totally honest, I'm getting like nervous about is so how do I learn about the different plants? How do I learn about this? this garden that you're painting for us. Like, I think that's where we get a little scared and intimidated. Yes. So um, one way to reflect on it is what are the plants that are already in your garden? So Mariette, what are the ways that you're already contributing right now? So one, you are a parent, right? That can be one of your plants is that you're a parent. And then what are the other ways that you contribute? Things that you maybe do for money, maybe volunteering or other ways that you contribute. So you can have your garden as it is now. 
And then one question that I found helpful and other folks have also found helpful relates to this quote by um, Frederick Buchner, who said, we are called to the place where the world's deepest hunger meets our deepest gladness. We are called to the place where the world's deepest hunger meets our deepest gladness. So if you want to reflect on how you might shift your garden, you might say, what is it that's breaking my heart right now? What is it that's moving me or concerning me? What are the issues or topics of concern? They might be local, they might be global, they might be ecological or social, what, whatever they are, that's the world's hunger as it's showing up for you. And then where does that connect with your deepest gladness? What brings you joy when you step into flow or when you have a sense of thriving? And if you, if you journal those or you reflect on those and you find that overlap, that might guide to a new seed or a new direction for a plant that is already in your garden. That might enliven your garden more or that might give your garden an even greater sense of alignment with the direction or care that you'd like to contribute in the world. So those are just a few ways. But one other is to reflect on how you are doing financially right now and doing a financial assessment of your garden, right? What's producing money? How often? Like some things they produce money regularly, some things it's one off, right? Like there's there's diversity in our gardens in that way. And as you reflect on your needs and your garden and the solidarity economy ways you can meet your needs, it might help you know what you might need to prune, what night might you need to water, and what might you want to plant as you reflect on your financial assessment for yourself, your family, or even your community. So those are some ways that you can work with this model as you're thinking on. Thank you. Oh my gosh. And just what that brought to my mind as you were talking about pruning is just the recognition, getting back to the ideas you were expressing before on care economy and feminist economy and Buddhist economy is that money is not the only form of value. And considering what other forms of value are those things bringing in, because there is there are different kinds of capital, there's social capital, there's spiritual capital, and recognizing that so many of those things might be worth more than money to us. And if we're only considering financial capital as being of value, then we're cutting out so many areas of our lives that have deep, profound meaning. So thank you. And Matthew, I want to acknowledge you had your hand up a little bit ago. Let me just say, Ingrid, that the metaphor there is around the, the what are the fruits or the offerings of each plant? Yes. That's why it's expanded. Some of them, it is financial, mm -hmm. but what are the other ways? Like there may be something else that you do that you love and what is it offering you? So what are the other gifts? Just to affirm what you're saying. Yeah. Thank you. Matthew. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you. This is mind blowing. And I think, I think why it's amazing for me is that you're creating access to a field of knowing that is often perceived as inaccessible, right? Like you have to have a degree and then you have to study these books and you have to have, uh, you know, statistical analysis and all this other stuff to even be able to play in this field of economics. So thank you for providing that access. Um, and I think a couple of things I want to highlight um, related to our community that are, I think are really relevant. One, just how you're using the analogy or the metaphor of the garden is actually a way that we can talk to our clients about financial statements and when you're saying, oh, what, what do you need to prune? What do you need to compost? What do you need to put more water into, right? That's an easy way for us as accounting professionals to make our work in finances and numbers accessible through language to our clients. So that's a tip for all of you watching out there who are like trying to figure out how to make your accounting or your financial statements accessible. Um, but two things that come out, and then I wanna ask the question. Um, you, you know, you talked about, um, zero waste. And we always talk about, or one of the things we talk about is KPIs or things that we can measure as a, as regenerative accounting professionals. And, and I think that's an example of something that we could pay attention to and help our clients be aware of like, hey, what was your waste like this month? And, and how can we help you to relate that to, to measuring things? Um, and I think one of the biggest things that we talk about here at the AAN is the idea of, of how accounting professionals steward them are a part of stewarding the money story 
right? And so when you were talking earlier about um, relationship to profit and how profit gets used, right? What would it look like if accounting professionals who are sitting down looking at the profitability of a business would then, you know, even pr propose a question or put 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 an idea on the table and say, hey, how are you relating to this word? What does that mean to you? How does that an expression of your values for the world that you want to create, right? It's like, it's a different kind of question that we get to ask when we look at those pro th this piece called profit. Um, but I want to ask you a question. This is, this is sort of related to my own lack of understanding around the relationship between economics and capitalism. One of the things that has come up um, in in some of the circles that I work inside of is the is the concept of conscious capitalism, and it's been around for a while. It's a term that's popularized, I think, in certain sectors of the business community. Um, how how does conscious capitalism fit into this evolution towards regenerative a, a regenerative eco economic system? Like, I'm curious what your what your help help us to understand that a little more, a bit more. Yeah, great question. So yeah, when I when I think about capitalism, what I do in my mind is I break it up into parts. Like I love doing that. Like what are the operating principles of capitalism? So, you know, we have the private ownership of the means of production in the hands of a few, right? The capitalist and the, the rest of us, we could say. Um, so that's, you know, not very democratic, like I was mentioning and not very transparent and highly unequal, right? Um, we also have the profit incentive, the profit motive, the profit mechanism, which as many folks that I was saying earlier about the not-for-profit economy would say that's how wealth is being siphoned out of the economy into the hands of the elite. It's like leaving the economy and, and going elsewhere. Another thing is uh, capitalism's view is nature as an input, right? A resource to be used and exploited. Another is its sense of being ahistorical, right? Not rep not recognizing what we call primitive accumulation or ongoing processes of accumulation, meaning ways that um, capital is created. So land theft or um, slavery or, you know, the removal of people from commons, like lands. So, and then also lack of future thinking. So I would say there's all these elements of capitalism and there are ways in all those areas that people are innovating or changing or challenging and making them better. And Catherine Trebek, um, she, she said to me, you know, we need to know when we're helping people survive today and when we're helping build tomorrow. So I would say um, conscious capitalism, when I've looked into it, has felt really like helping people survive today. It's felt more ethical, more kind, more transparent, more democratic, but it doesn't truly change the operating principles of capitalism that are inherent in what's causing inequality and houselessness and environmental degradation and um, climate change. So I would say, you know, when is something like a when is something like making capitalism more palatable or more benign, maybe? And when are we truly moving in a just transition or a great turning to a new system? And I would say conscious capitalism does the first, but not the second. So I'm more inspired by the new economy movement, the next system project, right? Like all these different things, post-capitalist thinking and practice that really looks at the operating principles and fundamentally changes them. Doesn't make them more conscious or more ethical, but fundamentally changes them so that the system on the other side really truly is more in alignment with human and planetary happiness and health and well-being. Love Thank that. You. Yeah, that's amazing. I feel like um, a, a lot of what I just heard you say kind of comes into alignment with things that I've heard before along the lines of the electric light bulb was invented by gaslight. The motor vehicle was in was created by people who were getting to work on horseback and on foot and by bicycle. So we are in the system that we are currently in, and we are also working to create a future, and we're not there yet. So I'm hearing you say that conscious capitalism is kind of a step in the right direction, and it doesn't make capitalism any less unsustainable in the long run that eventually we're going to have to 
slowly change out all of the spokes on that wheel. And in the meantime, we've got to keep the wheel turning so that it doesn't just completely stop because if the wheel stops turning, it's going to impact our most marginalized peoples and our planet first. So how do we create those opportunities? And we've got a couple more really great questions in the chat that I would love to bring voice to. Um, Vidya asks, um, she's got a couple great ones. She asked first, how would cooperatives fit with the not-for-profit model? And then the other question um, was, I would like to know how to account for labor as an asset rather than a liability. I'm told that Marxist economists have been exploring this idea, but not sure how. Let me let me go for the first one. And then if you can repeat the second one, that'll be helpful. So the first question was, how do cooperatives connect with the not-for-profit model? So cooperatives are still for profit. So although they change some of the elements of capitalism, such as worker ownership, so it doesn't have the capitalist ownership, it has the worker ownership, and it has democratic decision-making, often greater pay equity, um, and it also has the Rochdale principles, which are a set of governing principles that are embedded in a worker cooperative. So it has those elements, and yet it is still for profit. And so it still has the siphoning of wealth um, out of the economy, and it can still have the growth imperative. And often profit, or all the time, profit is the bottom, bottom line, even if there is a social or an ecological mission to the cooperative, which there often is. So the better or like the more evolved model, the truly post-capitalist model there would be the worker self-directed nonprofit not-for-profit business model. So you would have a, a nonprofit that is horizontally governed. There's sociocracy or, you know, collective decision-making. And then you would have a way that they generate unrestricted funding. So a sales of goods and services that generates profit that can go to the mission-driven work. The reason why that's important is, and I'm sure folks in this space maybe have experienced this, but nonprofits can be very beholden to the um, the grantors or the foundations or their donors, right? It can often restrict the work that they do. Anand Gurditas wrote a book called Winners Take All, and it's all about how if, um, if nonprofits were not like grant funded, like they're restricted because foundations would never actually fund the projects that would change the status quo that they benefit from. And so what nonprofits really need is unrestricted funding. So that's why this profit generation from sale and goods and services can be so liberating for nonprofits. So yeah, beyond the worker cooperative would be the worker self-directed nonprofit, not for profit business model. Fantastic. Thank you. And I see video posting in the chat that <laughs> that makes so much more sense. Um, and Matthew, you also just posted something in the chat. Do you want to speak to that before we? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I do want to underscore like one of the books, Stella, that has informed us and our community is um, Charles Eisenstein's Sacred Economics. And and the subtitle of that, I think, is critical. It's the age of transition or the I think it's the age of transition. Um, or at least he talks about what what Ingrid was mentioning about how we're still in this world and we're aiming for that world and and so there's sort of navigating the um, the transition period right and, um, and and as our industry as the accounting profession evolves and we move towards I mean one of the biggest um, I think what I, what I think the biggest trends is and particularly impacted with the influence of air the capacity provided to us through artificial intelligence is our ability to step into a deeper strategic advisory roles where our, our objective is no longer, um, you know, how do we record this transaction because the computer has got that, but to how do we help this business owner navigate 
the marketplace that we're in and, and the, the volatility of the, of, of what's going on with, 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 uh, with the workforce. I mean, you know, it's, it's much bigger problems that we're helping them to solve from a functional numbers perspective. And, um, and, 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 and so it's awesome because now we get to evolve into these deeply strategic advisory um, uh, uh, people in, in our clients' lives and, understanding the business models that our clients are stepping into or are, are adhering to is part of that equation. So, so, you know, example, if you can't, if you don't understand how nonprofits function and, and ultimately how nonprofit accounting occurs, your ability to serve a nonprofit as an accounting professional is fairly hindered. But if you understand the business model, you get the dynamics of what it means to be a nonprofit, your ability to serve that nonprofit elevates, right? And so with these new business models, or these, I would say, more regenerative business models out there, um, I think what, what is really uh, available to us is saying like, oh, to be able to know what a cooperative is, or a worker self-directed nonprofit is, as an accounting professional, means that we can then step into these, um, these future forward business models and help our clients to evolve into it. And I also think that understanding them gives us this potential to help help our clients navigate from a very from a very practical um, sort of um, financially sound perspective, navigate from one business model to the next, right? Sort of being the one to guide. Or, or hospice, if you will, the uh, out the old business model and in in into the new one. So I, I I'm really excited that you're you're sharing this with us and giving us this context. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And yeah, I love I love this idea of like, you know, how might you bring in some of what you're hearing into your your accounting work? And I do I really hear you that you're saying like to know the different types of business models, that is one way, especially as someone's like just starting, maybe they're coming to you and they're saying, I, I want to start this business. Here's my idea. Here's my pitch that you might just know the, the options of all the alternatives, right? I think that that'll be hugely helpful. And then I do wonder like, and, and maybe this is a question for you, Matthew or Ingrid, it's like this question on enoughness, like, is there a way to talk to, like, I'm thinking of, um, you know, a, like a local pizza place being like, okay, what are your, um, your costs, you know, labor costs, your costs, your like, um, supply chain, all of that. Um, what is enough? What is, what is investment or reinvestment? What is rainy day money, right? Like if your your oven breaks, right. But then what is excess and what do you want to do with excess? Could excess be donated to the nonprofit down the street? Could excess be, a few meals that you provide each week for the houseless people in the community. Like, like, I wonder how much accounting could get into that, like enoughness, gratitude, sufficiency, and like redirection of surplus or profit to mission driven work. Yeah. Well, I mean, the short answer is you just gave us really good questions to ask people when we present the financial statements to them, like asking that question, is this enough? Okay what does that mean to you? How do you, you know, like just being able to present that question with the financial statement creates the conversation. And it might not, we might not be able to, you know, address and answer all the different components of that. And I think that creates space for like helping people to, but even just asking the question to begin the conversation is sometimes enough to, to start the change that we're looking for. Yeah. Um, and I want to give voice to what Donna Reed posted in the chat there, the business models that are for for-profit businesses that have a mission element that they serve. And that is a big piece of what we're working to create through the Accounting Alchemy Network and through um, mine and others works as coaches and consultants trying to help businesses be more mission and values focused. What is the real purpose of what you're trying to do? Are you just trying to feed your family? Are you just trying to make your own profit and survive in this crazy world? Or are you trying to make some kind of an impact? And what is that impact? What change do you want to see in the world? How can we use our work in the world to create the change that we want to see in the world? Because there's the potential to do that if we simply apply ourselves to that and how we as accounting professionals can start to hold the container for that conversation and help businesses to start to measure what really matters, recognizing that 
Yes, a business needs to be profitable in order to continue. Profit is the price we pay for tomorrow. If it is not profitable, it's not going to be sustainable. And there are things that are still more important than profit, people, and planet. Primarily, how are we measuring those other things? Like you were saying earlier, Della, around our, our gross domestic product being, you know, this, this focus in economics that has us promoting economies that are, by that metric of success, doing better in a sick society. War is very profitable. Our broken medical systems are extremely profitable. So starting to look at where are our businesses extractive of our planet, exploitive of our peoples, how, what else can we be measuring besides profit? Yes, profit is an important metric, but it's not the only thing to measure and it's not even the most important thing to measure. Thank you. And Ingrid, you had a second question and I think it escaped my mind if you want to yes. ask again. Vidya had a great question. She asked about how to account for labor as an asset rather than a liability. I'm told that Marxist economists have been exploring this idea, but not sure how. That's a very interesting question. And I, am I assuming that it's in a, like a for-profit business setting that that would be? Would you assume that? I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know if, um, I don't know if, if Vidya wants to, um, explain a little bit more in chat, or if you want to raise your hand, we'd be happy to promote you to panelist. Okay, we've got a hand up. Ta -da. Hi, I'm sorry for crashing. <laughs> oh, you're doing um, great. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's a tremendous overlap anyway with my field. So, um, but I'm actually trying to, after years of abuse, actually in the nonprofit world, the nonprofit industrial complex, um, where I don't think anybody was trying to change anything. Obviously, that's not 100%. I mean, um, but for those of us who were trying to change some things, we were given, you know, watered down business school versions of uh, everything, operations and accounting and, you know, um, metric standards. And and so um, my field is program evaluation. And, and, and so now, um, after a huge long story, uh, uh, which I will spare you, I started my own business during COVID. And, um, and I am trying to do many of the same things that we've talked about here today, but I'm struggling to, um, I mean, I, I will just say one thing as a business owner, a new business owner now, like um, just surviving, uh, especially some of us <laughs> um, is actually changing the world. Um, so I don't, I don't want to knock, uh, you know, um, folks who, 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 you know, just putting food on the table, putting roof over your head is, is hard enough. That said, um, I am trying to think about my accounting differently, um, because we are trying to fund a lot of projects, um, in the world and, um, and yet not, um, you know, suffer in the process. And so, um, so I've just been trying to think creatively about, um, accounting. So in this case, yes, it is in a for-profit, I guess, because I'm an escor right now. I'm trying to build, I was trying to build a co-op. I mean, I'm, I'm still trying to build, I'm still trying to organize, but, uh, but now I have more, you know, options available thanks to this meeting. Thank you. Um, and, uh, in either case, you know, and then we also do have a nonprofit, my partner and I have a nonprofit that we also run. So, I didn't know even how accounting differs among these three. Mm -hmm. um, my interest was just not replicating the slave economy's um, ideas about what labor and time and, um, you know, money are. So, which actually, I mean, my understanding is that that kind of accounting started in, in colonial times and, you know, even before the transatlantic slave trade, but I'll stop there. Mm, yeah, thank you for sharing your experience. And yeah, what, one thing that's coming up for me is, you know, when when I talk about the not-for-profit business model, this redirection of profit to social and environmental good, 
there has to be a certain like scale for that because a lot of times small business owners really aren't at that level where they have tons of profit. So it's not really applicable. Like my partner um, owns and runs a um, bar and restaurant here in San Francisco. And there has been no year that he has uh, paid himself the amount that is um, happiness and income correlated, which is about $100,000 a year. But of course, that should be subject to different areas and things. But um, he's not gotten to that for himself, for his workers. And so this idea of profit is not really applicable. This like excess that could go towards another nonprofit or a mission driven cause. So just to kind of clarify that really when we are on that part of the curve where we don't have enoughness, where we aren't at sufficiency, where we aren't at plateau, um, you know, more money does equal more happiness or, or, or health for us and for our families. And that, of course, is a valid thing. So really, when I think about that model, I think about the places where there is a lot of excess. Like I think about... Um, like I'm in San Francisco, the tech companies or banks, like like the institutions that are making so much wealth for shareholders or for owners, right? Like the, I'm talking about those where if that wealth was redirected towards mission-driven work, towards a nonprofit, towards a not-for-profit business model, what what social or an ecological issues could be addressed or solved? That that's more where it's more applicable, if that makes sense. Um, but I have known individuals who have brought the not-for-profit business model in, such as done some work that pays and maybe pays a little bit more so that they can do a couple hours either pro bono or free or by donation. So there are ways that you can arrange your garden so that some things generate more profit so you can do other work for free, but so that your time is still compensated. Um, but you bring up a bigger question around like, yeah, payment and hours and that's a really interesting thing. A lot of research shows that when people come together and they decide um, pay discrepancy, pay discrepancy or like differentials, they'll they'll be okay with something like six to ten times different. Like they're okay with that. So we are okay as humans with pay differential due to experience or management or like you know a different responsibility. But we are not okay as a whole with the pay differentials that are in really mainstream mega corporations, which on average are about one to 365 times. So that is another thing that is decided when there is more democracy in the workplace and more self governance that is taken into account. Thank you, Doug. Um, I want to ask another question from somebody earlier. Um, um, Alina had asked this question. Um, how do you or we have these conversations with folks who are perhaps defensive about the good parts of capitalism? Um, you know, we're, we're having discourse with people and really in many ways talking about considering something different. So I'd love, what's your, what's your response to her question about navigating the, um, the defensiveness? Yeah, well, I would say that the word capitalist can be quite div divisive, like on the start. So if you're at all approaching a conversation or something with someone who, for whom that might be the case to maybe go with the mechanics, like the operating principles or values, like what's going on for them? What are they appreciating? What are they liking? And again, when, when I break it down and I can look in each area, what are like the innovations or the things that are being feeling better? Like, for example, um, oh gosh, nonprofits or businesses feel so hierarchical and wow, this pay differential of one to 365 times, like, have you heard of sociocracy or like these horizontal governance models where um, groups of the people who are doing the work have more say over the work they're doing and like bringing in the benefits to that. Like, I don't think you have to even bring in the word capitalism to have that conversation, to talk about the innovations in these different ways. Um, circular economy too. Like you don't need to bring in capitalism to be like, what happens to the waste? And like, oh, have you heard about Ikea? They're, they actually might move to a model where 100% of Ikea furniture is given back to Ikea to be reused for the next cycle. You know, like things like that. That's um, different ways. So yeah, and then, you know, I would also reflect on like, what is the harm? And if you can also get personal about it, like, um, for example, there's this concept of alienation, right, from Marxism. 
which is like workers are alienated from what they produce right and that feels so heady and everything if you can have a personal story like I had this friend he was a designer he designed bags and and fashion and he worked for a designer so he was an employee of a design company and when he left the design company said all of the designs that he made were owned by the company and he could take nothing with him he couldn't even show a portfolio of images or suitcases or images that he made so he was completely, the word is alienated from his labor, but I wouldn't even use that. I'd say he, he left with nothing, not even a single image of, of like 10 years of experience. Like that doesn't feel fair, right? So getting with those personal stories, I think can often feel helpful too. Thank you. Love that. And I want to give voice to another um question in the chat, Mariette posted, I really want to understand how regenerative is being used in the simplest sense in this conversation in a way I can explain to others, which I think is a great question for us to end on. Recognize we have just a few minutes left before we wrap up. Yes, I'll end with that question. And then I have a poem I want to close with. Mm -hmm. um, so regenerative, in my understanding, is that which is life giving right? To regenerate. To generate is to give life. To regenerate is to re-give life, right? So um, another frame I think of Joanna Macy, an eco-justice Buddhist, philo Buddhist, Buddhist philosopher and activist. She talks about this time is called the great turning. It's a turning towards life. So it's like, what is our orientation? What helps us like with making decisions and with knowing what's right or wrong and life giving or turning towards life? This, this can be a helpful thing or leaving things better than found. Like these are some things that I've found useful. So to be regenerative is like what brings more life? So what brings more life to a community? What brings more life to uh, um, to nature, right? To, to enhance nature's abilities or to enhance the vitality and the health of the natural world? What brings more life to our relationships with one another? So that's what regenerative means to me. And, and I think there's there's this ongoing debate about sustainable and regenerative. And I do think sustaining, sustaining life is also a beautiful thing. Although there are folks saying we don't want to sustain that which we have because what we have currently is unsustainable. So I do think there is partly just to move from sustainability to regeneration, but just to check in with ourselves and to ask like, you know, when am I contributing to suffering or to harm and when am I contributing to life giving or life life regenerating properties or principles or life so I'm going to share screen one last time really as, good as, before we do that yeah I yeah go ahead. just ask oh good you've got it up there on the screen all of the connect things and I posted the link to upstream podcast in the chat along with a video we have from the accounting alchemy network on our definition of regenerative and where it balances with that unsustainable, Rock but yeah, on. Della, where else can we find you? That was going to be my next question before the poem. Good. I'm just trying to find a way to share this one second. We're struggling, but you can see that. Yep. Um, there we go. All right. So before closing a few ways to join me, I'm teaching a course called cultivating regenerative livelihood. Um, and that's through Gaia Education. I'll actually send that. That's the wrong thing there. But the second point, California Donut Economics. This is important. The donut that I mentioned, we've created a nonprofit, actually a worker self-directed nonprofit called the California Donut Economics Coalition. And we got a grant and we're about to hire for a ton of positions, including a development uh, lead and a finance lead. So if anyone has any connections or is in need of another plant in your livelihood garden, um, join our listserv and we'd love to have you join us. And then I have two retreats coming up next year, singing, permaculture, and the work that reconnects. So, um, and then there's the links there. So to, cl to close, I want to close with a poem. And this is one that I wrote and it's called What is Economics? And this is just to close with that way of expanding our view of economics. So just to close... What is economics? Economics is about our relationship with ourselves. It's about how we use our time, what we do for leisure, our pace, about our ratio of being to doing, about our connection with our passions and our hobbies, about that which we call our own, about our locus of control, our sense of self-worth, 
about the rhythm of our days, about how we introduce ourselves, the quality of our present, how we envision our future, about our freedoms and our constraints, about how we meet our needs, about our role in society, our right livelihood, our mythopoetic identity. Economics is about our relationship with each other. It's about whether we see collaborators or competitors, separation or solidarity, interbeing or alienation. It's about our level of trust, about the strength of our democracy, about how we relate to power, how we manage our housework, our child rearing, our commons, how we care and get cared for, what we give and what we get and how much we share. Economics is about our relationship with the earth. It's our connection with land, our bioregions, our watersheds, our sense of belonging, what we build and how we build it, what and how we eat, where our food comes from and what happens to our waste. It's about whether we see the natural world as a supply house or a sewer, a battlefield or a lover, an animate being, Gaia, or a larger ecological self. Economics has the ability to isolate, subjugate, unite, and empower. It's myth and fact, crisis and opportunity, alive and lifeless, systemic and personal. Economics is not simply the bottom line, the marketplace, the profit margin, or the banknote, and it's not something outside of us. Economics is valueful, valuable, and here. Thank you all. Good to be with you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Della. This was absolutely fantastic. And yeah, let's keep the conversation going in the Accounting Alchemy Network and appreciate you so much taking this time to be here with us today. We'll be sending you follow-up questions, I'm sure. Yes. And I'll send the slides. You can share them with folks listening. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.